We now have a very distinguished guest, and he is a very renowned Mongolian scholar, Mr. Jalal Sehun. Uh, is an independent economist and media representative of Mongolia. He's a Mongolian political and economic observer, columnist, and the host of TV De Facto Debate, De Facto Review, and De Facto Interview weekly television interviews on VTV in Mongolia, featuring distinguished Mongolian, English, and Russian-speaking guests from across the globe. Jarlat also hosts Radio De Facto, a radio talk show aired daily at 6.30 p.m. at Business Radio. He's a founder of De Facto Institute, an independent research think tank that also publishes the De Facto Gazette, a weekly analytical newspaper covering the political and economics of Mongolia in English, Japanese, Russian, and Mongolia. Welcome, Mr. Javasahan. Good afternoon, welcome to Mongolia. Some people I know, very glad to see you. I'm um, actually a Montpelieran Society member since 2006. So probably uh, maybe we will speak in more closed languages. Well, uh, my topic is such a grand title, but uh, it's not about that, but it is about uh, what I do. I think uh, now with uh, information revolution and uh, current globalization or deglobalization, uh, now the situation changes completely in many countries. Many people have more chances to have more successes in their uh, life, daily life. And uh, in a particular country like Mongolia, where we have uh, a parallel transition compared to our two political, two, two large neighbors. So we kind of a lap of humankind where empowered people, if they are free, the economy is free, if more market economic principles work, the people can live better, faster. That's the belief we have. So we are, I'm coming from that belief. So um, originally I'm a financial guy, used to work as a CEO of commercial bank and CEO of a leasing company, the largest leasing company in the country. But I have self-turned myself to uh, media uh, as... Uh, in uh, 2009, I decided to write an article about current situation, political, economic situation in the country as I found in our magazines, journalism, uh, they write a lot, but they don't write, or not much write about uh, things very concise and short. Because people don't read now anymore more than two pages. And still it must have a, such a clear subtitle, so that people, once they start to read, they should finish. They, they, fin they should be such an interesting, they should finish. And I come from that belief, and I decided in 2009, in middle, in May, to write an article about really situations we face in the country with certain solutions. And that solution should be based on free market, all economic issues. So I decided to write, and I decided to do it for 10 years, and I should write every week. So next month, I will have my 10th year. I have not missed a week around, or well, some it was public holidays or newspapers sometimes didn't go out. But altogether, some 100, 500, number 500 article is coming soon. And all these articles are also in English because what's happening in this country are also of interest of not only the whole world, but on our two neighbors. In the south, we have a Mongolians, five million Mongolians in Inner Mongolia. We are here three millions. In the north, we have more than one million Mongolians, Buryat Mongolians. Now they are looking more and more at Mongolia, in spite of a smaller economy, in spite of all what's, what you see. Why? 
because here people are empowered, people have a freedom of speech. So now I, I, I was several times in Russia, recently in Russia, Siberia, and they have, I think, a kind of identity crisis. On one side, they look Mongolian, but they don't speak Mongolian, and they speak only Russian. And yet, Mongolia is the country where the people can express. So that's why I do my Russian TV program every week in Russian now, which is rebroadcasted in Russia, Siberia. And I think it's a small little voice of what's happening in this country. So um, um, let me. So I think at this time we need to have a knowledge into products, intellectual product, in particular because so much information are in the world. Now people are not very much interested to learn because they can find any information on the website, on the internet immediately, anything. But they are not gener generalizing or generating knowledge. So people somehow don't want, somehow basically they just look at things and never generate knowledge as before the information uh, age. So I decided to make this article. Um, so I was uh, planning for, as I said, 10 years ahead, but I needed a particular marketing, cross marketing. So I need to find a name that cannot be repeated anywhere else. It was a, that we found out this de facto, but Jargal is the only Mongolian name, so it, its combination cannot be repeated anywhere else. So jargaldefacto.com, I got this copyrights everything registry. Then I decided to make uh, that, as I said, article. But a year after, I started a writing article, I needed to have a TV program because 90% of Mongolians receive their knowledge, information through TV, it turned out. So I need to be on TV and I cannot give a lecture on TV. So I decided to interview people, interesting people coming to this country. And I decided to do that uh, mostly the politicians, very interesting people otherwise were coming to Mongolia. There was no TV program in the country, no interview for those, with the, those guests. So I decided to do, and by now I have interviewed about 800 people, including uh, many interesting people of different walks. Dalai Lama, presidents, prime ministers, queens, Nobel laureates, anybody. And I have uh, two interviews a week now. So altogether, all, everything is on this uh, website you see. I will just a couple show it. This is the, this is the program we have. Uh, this is an interview. And all interviews have a subtitle. Uh, if it is in English, then it, this is interesting, man. Just one of the recent interviews. Um, he is uh, Edmund Moy. He was a uh, head of uh, U.S. Mint for quite some time, Chinese American, and we were talking about not only um, Mint, etc., but uh, he was here giving a lecture of business ethics. Quite interesting. And then um, we talked about the blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies, etc. So all this goes, as you see here. Uh, here, the subtitles, that's quite some work because you first subtitle, translate it and put it into the way how they speak. And um, Mr. Schooland was on my program, very pleased. Mr. Lingel was there. So uh, this kind of unique guests, otherwise, this is knowledge accumulation, by the way. Otherwise, these people will come and speak to 90 person and leave. Now they can speak to many people, as many people as they want. And that's why I think I thought this website, this knowledge kind of archive of Mongolia. Um, this is an interview, and then uh, this is an interview, uh, then uh, this is a review. Well, that review is becoming popular because, uh, okay. This review I do every Sunday in uh, three languages, 5.30 in uh, 
in 513 in the Russian, which is broadcast in the Russia, on one TV channel. On another TV channel I do in English, MNB World, and then in the Mongolian in the VTV. I cover only three issues of last week, most important three issues that may shape the country, the way people think, work, and benefit. And as a transition economy, as a young democracy, we have a lot of problems to talk, and I have, I have uh, always uh, more topics than I need to talk. <laughs> it's never-ending topics in the country. Last week's topic, for example, was uh, Ayu Tolwa, the largest coal mine. I, everybody who is here, who is an economist, to know that project. This is the third largest copper project in the world, after Escandido, Chile, and Grasberg, Indonesia, and Mongolia, or Utah. There is a big debate. When close, we come close to, close to election, then there is always heroes, populists coming, you know, you know, trying to say that we will not give this uh, Westerners our wealth, we will take it more, they are this and that. So there are a lot of populists, in, uh, and because the distribution of uh, value created I mean, we have not created the mother, created this value. But uh, somehow it's trickling down in a poor governed country. Somehow few people are becoming rich. Not everybody is feeling the benefit of this. So as a result, this populist always win. So I had to write last week uh, and a review also to make that, I mean, in fact, what is that project about? in very short nutshell. Nobody is uh, putting it into one page. So I did uh, work specially on that. It turned out 12 billion US dollar total investment. Three billion of them is e equity investment. The remaining is a uh, borrowing. So 12 million dollars investment by now for the last 10 years and six million dollars total sales revenue. So we talk about 18 million US dollars. So how it, it, where it has gone? Nine billion, or half of it, went to the Mongolian economy in the form of salary, in the form of buying products and goods from uh, Mongolian suppliers. Then another half, uh, one third probably, go to equipment and other, other costs. But the other costs uh, was a problem. Management cost, 3%. Rio Tinto is charging of the total cost 3%. Understandable, but Mongolia is opposing it. So all these facts I put together, that's what they say, that's what is here. So the best thing is go ahead with the project. Otherwise, you will, like, if you stop the project, 14,000 Mongolians will have no jobs. And about 400 Mongolian companies will not have business. And the rate of Tugrik will be twice or three times weaker than now. Then, then people, nobody is explaining into the details. So it is not that difficult once you have a financial education, but you put it into a very short way that everybody understands, very short. Then now, in the, in the age of fake news, people are know beforehand what is the general true picture. So that's a uh, review, and an article, as I said, and all these articles go in, uh, in now in um, English and Japanese and Russian, all of them. And soon I'm working on having in uh, Chinese. So this is my product. No, uh, yeah, this is my product. And now all these products, thanks to the large media companies like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, this, is, this gives great opportunity to countries like Mongolia, where we can, so all channels can be used. All my TV interviews and all my programs go Facebook Live. Those who have Facebook, they can watch anyway. And then, uh, piece by piece, they are retweeted, they reposted. So the outreaching. And the other thing, how to outreach Mongolian nomads. All Mongolian nomads have cell phones wherever in this big country. And there is no electricity, but they have a cell phone charged by solar energy, solar panel. And that solar panel gives them a light, one bulb, 
one small refrigerator, one TV, and two cell phones to be charged. And the cell phone they to, to use all around now. We have three million people, four million uh, cell phones, and 80% of the cell phones are smartphones. So this is a different arena because it's so remote, so few of us, this is something that they will not uh, sell it for anything. So, so uh, that's why on these channels I go, and for those nomads, we have uh, two competing satellite TV channels in Mongolia. And, and one of them, Mongsat, I am there, it's new one, competing with the old one. There are two satellites in Mongolia from two different angles. And that new satellite has a rather good coverage, including all the way to Vladivostok. So that's there, you can work, you can bring the information, whether they, I mean, that's the freedom you, you have. So all these products are done in this way. Now, so I'm talking about the products, trying to have a special uh, knowledge, uh, squeezing into this uh, very short uh, contest. Uh, and now it was important to have a cross-marketing. So every, everything what I do comes with the name de facto. And whatever you talk about one product, then you market in the other products. So as a result, now you are now known by all country, um, uh, 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 country, and uh, each product is a, uh, is a cross marketing. Mm. As you see, this is everything what I do on this website, and these are the uh, languages we have. Many articles are, all articles are in Mongolian and in English, and some half probably in the Russian and half in Japanese. Now uh, Korean is coming and Chinese is coming. Why Chinese? Chinese is a very important partner. And those, they, the, any, any, every investor, there's no almost information in Chinese from Mongolia. So we need to provide Chinese investors with the, with the independent information. So I, I believe this is a large market. So, uh, mm, now all these products combined back into the de facto Gazeta. De facto Gazeta, I met not, uh, it was not originally my plan, but uh, three years ago, after seven years publishing my article, uh, the largest newspaper in the country, refused to publish my article about corruption of that time speaker. We had a fight, so I left. Um, and uh, they have refused to publish. Another newspaper also uh, refused to put an article about uh, our president, also against a case where he was not decisive. And the article was called, Where is my president? The same word was in Indonesia, in Bali, when I, in uh, Jakarta, when I visited, when the President Jokowi did not deliver what he had promised when there was a um, corruption of the police chief involved, an anti-corruption agency, he was not taking a site. He was not taking the, 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 the uh, position he promised. The same with our president. So, so they have refused to publish my newspaper. So after three months, we started to make newspaper. Well, that's good news now. We are the largest online newspaper. We, uh, we sent to 18,000 people this by email. And it's also recently started to be published in, uh, on paper, and which is you can find on, uh, if you fly Mongolian Airlines at weekends, you, can, uh, you see these newspapers in three languages. So eventually and slowly, uh, we are becoming uh, more media kind of things. But however, unlike other traditional media, we start from online media. And all these products are made by three people. And that, that's why the efficiency gives us more faster movement. So we, and I was two weeks ago in uh, Vienna, there was a European Publishing Congress where people were talking about 500 European editors, magazines, newspapers. They were talking about the danger of journalism, yes, 
journalism is in the danger. But uh, the traditional media is disappearing because the advertisement online. I think r combining in the right way, uh, now the media has the, the best opportunity ever before. Go online, be digital, and combine for those who, who wants to read. Some people want to read in the paper. Let them read in the paper. So that's the business model we will do. And after five years of consistent work, consistent work, on time, whatever happens, you'll be there on time, prepare, short. After five years, we started to have uh, recognition all around. And uh, now we have uh, advertisement. Uh, we publish it on our uh, uh, ma uh, paper magazines, also online. Uh, 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 each has uh, advertisement in certain channels. Uh, uh, recently, we advertised in this our newspaper. So as a result, now we have a rather large presence on social media. We have a 200,000, 207,000 Twitter followers and 57,000 uh, 53,000 uh, Facebook likes. So with that, and with using short information, first giving, if they want, they can, you give the most interesting part of your content to social media, and those interested, they can visit through that. The, the social media gives you opportunity to have immediately link with the bigger content. That's how, I, how do we work so far. And, um, try to be uh, uh, on the trend. We more support now blockchain, cryptocurrency, and fintech. So that's the major directions our newspaper is now aiming because for a country like Mongolia, we are landlocked but not mindlocked. And there are several products coming and recently a company bought a bank, small commercial bank in, in the Philippines and they are converting it into the fintech company. And uh, the, the mobile phone gives such opportunity even for Mongolian uh, small country to go out and to have big market. So we are testing around 10 or so products are coming from Mongolia to the world market now as a, as a fintech, and which we are supporting. We uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a president of FinTech Association of Mongolia. We recently hosted a large uh, conference here. Next year it will be in Brazil. So, and those people who do towards the direction, because Mongolians mostly are young people, and I am to be always to be interested by these young people. It should be always interesting information, so we need to have more future looking. That's what is about very shortly what we have, we are doing. Again, uh, I think knowledge uh, now in a new format, that's what we whole society, whole world needs and looking for, in particular young people. And when they look at the, uh, the, their phone, iPhone, uh, they never deeply concentrate, just go, go to the next one. So as a result, the general, uh, knowledge is staying as such uh, as, as we understand before. There's not that much coming, I think, today to, to this world. That's all. Thank you. Questions? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Read. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Um, I'm very interested in your insights on the fintech in Mongolia. It's my first time to come here. Um, I'm very interested about fintech things like lending, banking, um, payment, insurance sort of things. Can, can, I sh can you share with me what's your uh, views on the fintech in Mongolia? In which sector would you think fintech would be very successful in the next three years? Uh, except the blockchain, I mean, blockchain is great, but any implementations for the small businesses or poor people? Can you give me your sites? Thank you. But FinTech, can you repeat yeah, exactly the questions? How, how FinTech can help the poor Mongolian or small businesses in Mongolia to grow in the next three years? Think tank or FinTech? FinTech. Huh? FinTech. Uh, FinTech. Thank you. Um, 
You know, for the first time in the world this year, we have uh, less ATM in the world. And for Mongolia, we have 16 banks. All of them had only ATM. Now, the substantial amount of ATM is not needed. And that's a major change. Even the, we have a programs we are teaching senior people how to use FinTech, how to use money transfer, etc. So people very reluctant to go to banks now. So that's way how it impacts on uh, families, on, uh, on the small medium enterprises, and banks are certainly, banks not very much happy with the FinTech development, as you know. But however, that goes, uh, FinTech develops very fast, and it outreaches the, 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 the guy in, on, the, on the horse, here, riding his horse and still he can transfer money mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of Norway, anyway, to his children, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a new trend and it's uh, very much taken by small medium enterprises. At the end now, the business is speed. Thank you. Uh, can I add one remarks on Wu Wei's uh, question? Uh, about uh, three years ago, there was a uh, fintech corporation, uh, a company uh, founded in Mongolia with two mathematicians, and then that the product was this, this was a small application uh, that is based on AI with some a personal uh, financial history of a person, and then they lend money without no collateral at all, from $10 to $150. You can take based on your history, but you don't give your information, they just collect it using their AI. So what they do is they, you don't have to go to any banks, you don't have to go any collateral to them, but you can lend just with your phone from 10 to $150. And that company was made public successfully. And then later on, they went to a Japanese venture capital. And they raised around, I don't remember the um, exact amount, but several hundred, uh, several million US dollars. And then they are going after eight countries with uh, installing the same product. Philippines, I think Malaysia, uh, some other Southeast East Asian countries. So I think the fintech startup is really starting to get ahead to the boom in Mongolia. Yeah, that's just one my remark. Yes. Sorry for it. Radonik, asfalt and hard asfalt. Ah, I think I in Gorodrin to show you Mongolia didn't seem to have the most like I have two questions. I don't think that the the people in the audience were given understanding about the Mongolian economy during those last three days. And there are those Mongolian citizens that are just touching pencils, that are touching just middle school kids. Can you please give uh, us certain information about the status of Mongolian economy to these people, uh, to us in the conference? How is the assault of those? Although we did this, and we did not do the results of the machinery that we did. And the second question is, we've been on the IMF uh, program several times. Yamash tour tungo. No, but no results. And no good. Let's say, although we did this, and we did not have any bad shoe. And what are you thinking about IMF? Ah, how you did the woman? But as such, some Mongols default to just how how you go with this kind of hirtip show. I was asking you ask ask this question from you two years ago. Maybe it's better if Mongolia defaulted. Maybe it's a better way for Mongolia if it's defaulted. Yeah, that's a big question. Yeah. Two questions. Please give a short introduction now from on Mongolian economy for the audience, and then what isn't the best way. Let me try very shortly to answer this question. This economy is dependent on mining completely. 85% of the export is from mining. Most of it of two products, copper and coal. And because of their prices, wherever it comes, the economy goes to that direction. Up, up, down, down. With the same mood of politicians. They behave like they have created the coal and copper. 
So that's whole thing very short. And we tried to diversify the economy, but with the current government, short-term vision, very hard. On the average, since 1990, the revolution we had about 20 governments, one and a half. I think we are on par with the Italians, <laughs> with the, in terms of amount of uh, government. So this short terms, people cannot make long term decisions. And a plus, because that's the main thing, uh, the core of Mongolian problems are secrecy of political parties financing. That's what uh, I'm fighting a lot. And because the financing is not clear, Declare the mark uh, every each political party head is behaving like mafia head, and they don't disclose, and they, they, even the oppositions don't demand that because they also have in secret <laughs> their money. So that that creates corruption, chronic capitalism, and that creates weak institution as government because the people go there not based on merit. They go there based on how close they are to the political, uh, the, the party leaders. So that's very brief and a pity picture of current situation in Mongolia. On second issue, IMF, yes, uh, if we had the default, you know, it's like we have a problem that we should better to solve it faster, as soon as possible. But um, not everybody thinks in that way. Their fault for many poor people comes very strong, it's more stronger than the rich people. And we have a big inequality now. Only 5% are very rich, 30% very poor, and 50% middle or lower, mid middle class. So in that circumstances, we have already kind of a lot of problems. Uh, em employment. We have 150. Uh, we have three million, as I said, but our labor market is around one million. And but out of them, 150,000 live abroad. One third, 50,000, in only in Korea. And they go. Our doctors, our teachers go there to do the blue collar worker, and they earn for two months, almost a year, a uh, uh, salary here. So that's the situation actually, and we need to solve, we need to diversify. And for that we need more market solution than the government solutions. So one of them is this. Uh, IMF kind of, you know, the economy is not dying, and they're injecting, injecting, but we're expecting they will one day wake up, but with the corrupt officials, very hard. So that's why I believe the solution is, let's keep me right and keep me sharpening, to do my job every day very active with the knowledge of ordinary people about why are they poor will make provoke them to to more press on the government they will provoke them not to sell their votes at the election so that's but it, it will take a long time but because this young country, I believe that we are moving much faster ahead. And I believe strongly in the future of the country, in the sense of the governance. Then we will not do the IMF or anybody else. The important thing is we need vibrant private sector. But unfortunately, because this uh, IMF and other supports, the government is creating more state companies, and each of them are running with the loss, like Erdinet, etc. And now the other thing, uh, one. Uh, owner of the largest bank are in prison, as we speak of. So this is a different story. It's a, it's a huge story. I want you to learn about why is that so. Then you will learn what's happening in Mongolia. But uh, unlike uh, many other countries where press is completely closed, this country is frequent. So we speak about that. So that gives us hope that we will win those who are stealing our properties. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I, I was very much impressed with your uh, type of work in the media and so on, and I'm sure that so many times you've uh, said things that angered the politicians, 
So how do they push back? Have they ever gotten so uh, upset with the, the, your in influence with the general population they tried to silence you or marginalize you? Uh, of course, many hate now, of course. Um, well, they attack on social media so far. Just recent case, a former mayor of Ulaanbaatar, three days ago, sent me a sent a tweet. Jargal, you must be very, Jargal, you must be very, having a big situation, a bad situation, as you are lying about me in, in, the, in, in the same voice as uh, the prime minister. It was about the land that is in a forest area in the north of the city. Very nice forest area. There is a international children's camp. And then suddenly inside of this camp, they start to give land. And including this mayor who had promised that he will, he did not give any land. But I had to work very hard to find it. I knew, but I needed to find the documents. So I went to the city officials, praised them, and then finally I got three pages with his own signature. And he had given the land without any... Why land is so important here? Because, and it's important anyway, but here there's no clear-cut differences between common lands, private lands, public lands, state lands. There's no clear-cut border. We know, but they don't put it on the paper because from every mayor up to now, they were selling our lands under the table, making themselves rich. So I found it, put it back. This is the way how I fight with them. I fight with facts. <coughs> facts is something, you know. And plus bureaucrats is like, bureaucrats, flies are the same. You can kill both with pepper. So bring the documents. That's <laughs> wow. Thank you, Mr. Donald. Thank you so much. Well, that's it.